In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. I don't think anyone would disagree that one of the unfortunate problems of our modern era is just how disconnected the world is, even as technology makes communication faster and easier. The human condition is the same now as it ever has been since the fall of man. The only difference is that we can now disseminate bad news more readily within the global village. Every violent and graphic detail of an assassination or terrorist plot is instantly available. The irony is that this ease of information only points out all the more dramatically how fractured and polarized we really are. In today's gospel, this alienation is shown to us not from the world's perspective, but from God's perspective. He was in the world, we are told, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. St. John is very different in his approach, isn't he, to the birth of the Savior. We don't hear the stories of shepherds and angels as we do in Luke, nor stars and wise men as we do in St. Matthew. We're not offered meticulous genealogies that trace the ancestry of Jesus back to Abraham or to Adam with all sorts of interesting women added to the mix as well. Rather, in John's gospel, we are invited into the very heart of the Trinity. Before anything was, there was God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The word of God, the creative power of God was such that when God spoke things which were came into being that had never been before. He spoke things into existence. Let there be light, and it was so. Let there be a firmament, and it was so. Let us make man in our own image and likeness, and it was so. But the crowning glory of God's creation, we human beings, rebelled and rejected the very source of our creation. We turned against God, and against one another. Lies and deceit and shame and fratricide, it's all right there in the very first chapters of the book of Genesis, isn't it? We don't have to walk 10 steps from Eden's gate to find the entire catalog of human sin. So what did the creator do about this spoiled project of his? Saint Anselm said that God had a dilemma. He had called the world good, And it is not possible that God should lie. Therefore, he was compelled by his own integrity to redeem our fallen world. Well, St. Anselm might be right, but I think that love is also a part of God's integrity. And his heart broke for us. And in his love, he could not bear to watch our misery from afar. When harmful things come to a child, what parent would settle for a telephone call? We want to be there in the very midst of the chaos to cry and to hug and to dry tears. And it was no different in the heart of God. And so his only begotten word, that aspect of God which from eternity had been his creative source, was conceived within the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary. As we heard in John's Gospel, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Fragile and vulnerable and hungry, rejected by his own people. The heir came to the vineyard and the sinful tenants threw him over the garden wall. And in the coldness of death, God himself showed us that there was nothing in our suffering that he had not known. He willingly lived the worst of the human experience in order that God and man might be reconciled. The exiles could come home. The alienation could end. As it is put in the book of Revelation, the tabernacle of God is with men again. He came to his own home and to his own people, and they received him not. But to all who received him, all who believed in his name, he gave the power to become the children of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Can we grasp just how profound that astounding bit of scripture is, the prologue of St. John's Gospel? These words inspired by the Holy Spirit, but given to us by the youngest of the disciples, the beloved disciple, 
the one who leaned on the breast of Jesus at the Last Supper and heard the beating heart of the world's creator and savior, the one who stood at the foot of the cross, the one to whom was entrusted the care of the Blessed Mother, the one to whom the heavens were opened and the glory of God revealed even as he was exiled on Patmos. Who could have known better the truth? Who could have been literally closer to the heart of God? And he tells us that not only is Jesus begotten of the Father, but if we are in him, if we are in Christ, then we too are made as he is, children of God, heirs of the promise, no longer tenants, no longer sojourners, no longer strangers in a foreign land. To all who receive him, to all who believe on his name, he has given the power to become children of God. That, in truth, is the whole meaning of Christmas, isn't it? And for heaven's sake, go tell it on the mountain. Christmas is not ended. Why, we are only beginning. Now that our Advent preparation has been done as best we could muster, now that the angels have sung and the shepherds have visited, it is our opportunity and privilege to ponder these truths in our hearts. May God grant us each the grace to do so and his perfect blessing and his peace throughout this holy season. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen.